Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening service. We're thankful that you're here. We also want to welcome those who are listening on radio or watching us on the World Wide Web. We hope that you'll stay tuned to our entire service tonight. Have a few announcements before I introduce our speaker. Uh, Donna will also be having tests this week. Uh, we're getting new kitchen appliances. If you have anything in the refrigerator or the freezer, uh, that's in the, the white refrigerator. The stainless refrigerator will not be replaced, but the small refrigerator back there will be replaced. So if you have any items in that uh, white refrigerator freezer unit, you need to get those out tonight. Next week, next Tuesday night, we will be hosting the Summer Youth Series here. And we're, we are in need of macaroni and cheese, baked beans, and cookie slash desserts for the Summer Youth Series. And the food items need to be here at the building by 5 p.m. on the 7th of July. Please contact Travis if you have any questions. The youth group is planning a trip uh, July 9th through the 11th. All luggage needs to be brought to the building Wednesday, July the 8th to be loaded. Also, all payments should be made by this time if you're planning to go. So any youth that uh, plan to go and haven't done that, you need to do that tonight. We're thankful to have a very special guest speaker tonight. Brother Glenn Record grew up in this congregation many years ago. <laughs> yeah, he still looks mighty young to me. But uh, he was baptized in 1978 by the preacher at the time. His name was Don Kane. Glenn is the son of David and Pat Record and the brother to Linda Janice and Carol Roach. He's married to Susan and is celebrating 25 years together this month. They have three children, Kevin, Scott, and Julie. Glenn graduated from David Lipscomb and Vanderbilt University and he is an engineer. He currently lives in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, he works for Dynatech, Dynatix, Dynetics, Dynetics. I'll get that right, Dynetics. Glenn served as a pulpit minister for the Winchester Road East Church of Christ for nine years. And he has taken several mission trips to Costa Rica. Glenn has been here on a few occasions before and and we know that you can trust that he will bring a very good message from God's word tonight. And uh, Glenn, we're just glad to have you back and, and your family as well. Uh, Scott will be leading singing tonight, so let's all join in together and sing. We'll have two songs, and then after we have our second song, the uh, first song is Thank You, Lord. The second will be Ancient Words. After we sing Ancient Words, Luke Phillips will lead us in prayer this evening. Let's all sing together. For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. For all that you've promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you. Jesus. 
Jesus, I thank you. Gratefully thank you. Thank you. Holy words, long preserved for a walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world where'er we roam. The ancient words will guide. Dear God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and worship you here in the middle of the week. We ask and hope that everything we do and say is in accordance with your will. Be with the speaker tonight, dear God. Let us take the message that we hear and apply it to our lives so we're better equipped to go out into the world and teach and bring lost souls to you. We ask a special blessing tonight on everyone who's been mentioned as being sick or in the hospital or having upcoming tests or surgeries. You know each situation, dear God, and help each one as only you can. Be with us as we go out through the rest of this week. Keep us safe. Forgive us our many sins. In Jesus' name, amen. If it's convenient, let's stand while we sing this next song. If you have kids that are going to class, they'll be dismissed while we sing Majesty. After we sing Majesty, then Mr. Record's going to bring us our lesson this evening. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be your glory, power, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his and the praise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. 
Well, good evening. It's, <laughs> it is a delight uh, to be here with you this evening. It's always, it always feels like I'm coming home when I speak to you. I don't know every one of you. Not every one of you knows me. Uh, but I was here uh, a long time ago. It's getting longer ago all the time, actually. And, uh, and every time I'm back here, I see so many faces uh, that bring back so many memories. And it's, uh, it's a great blessing to me to be able to, to, be able to speak to you tonight, uh, to be honored uh, to be a part of this series. I saw the, the roster, you know, they, they mailed me a, a copy of the list of speakers, and, and I figured I must have had some sort of family influence that was exerting some, you know, twisting the arms of the elders to be able to, you know, have me a part of this, uh, part of this series. But I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I understand from speaking with Dennis Farmer that um, that your Wednesday night series, he, he says, they're supposed to be really short. Uh, so uh, I said, so that means 50 minutes and not a full hour. Is that, uh, well, maybe I'll laugh, you'll laugh now, maybe then when 50 minutes passes, maybe that won't be so funny. Um, we're going to be using as a basis text John chapter 21 verses 15 through 19, if you would like to turn there. I'm going to read that, and uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour, and you may think it's quite a substantial detour, but we're going to get back here eventually. So, um, so read with me. John chapter 21, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast... Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress, dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. As, as Sonny mentioned, I work in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm an engineer. I've been an engineer for 25 years now. And, and the company I work with is an engineering company. That's, we, we primarily are a group of engineers. Um, a lot of geeks where I work. Um, and um, a few years ago, it's been a few years now, um, our company was celebrating uh, a, a milestone, an anniversary. It was the 35th anniversary of the company. And they had a special, you know, sometimes you hear of company picnics. Well, the company picnic that year was at the Space and Rocket Center, which is in Huntsville. Uh, you can see that in one of those pictures up there. It's the, the thing with the big rocket on it. Um, and they had a special guest for that evening ceremony. And the guest is somebody I'm guessing you probably have never heard of. In, in, in Huntsville, Alabama, this man is something of a celebrity. He is, he is not known by everybody. He's not universally known there. You may have heard of him. I don't know, but I doubt it. Um, his name is Homer Hickam. And um, he was the featured speaker that evening at the Davidson Center, which is where we had our gathering. And... and to give you a little background on who Homer Hickam is, um, not that you know him from this either, 
when he was a young man, when he was in high school, he was an avid rocketeer. He and his friends had a keen interest in rocketry. He, um, he and his friends were known in the small West Virginia town in which they lived. They were known as the Rocket Boys. He was uh, someone who had a great deal of success in his life. As you can imagine, someone who's invited to speak to uh, before a company of a thousand people, that, that he is um, going to have something, uh, some experience to draw from, something to say that's worth telling. And Homer Hickam had a life of success um, behind him. You see, when he was a, an aspiring high school student, his keen interest in rocketry and his uh, aggressive pursuit of, of learning about rockets led to him earning a gold medal at a national science fair. He attained one of his dreams, which was, and here's another name you guys, you guys may not know, Werner von Braun, do y'all know who that is? He's big, he's big time in, in Huntsville. They name all kinds of stuff after him down there. But his, Homer's hero was Werner von Braun. And he got an autographed picture. He got to meet Werner von Braun because he was the first prize winner of the National Science Fair. He went on from his high school experiences. He went to college. I think he went to Virginia Tech. Um, he went into the Army during the Vietnam War, was a decorated uh, soldier in Vietnam. After Vietnam, he achieved his lifelong dream of going to work for NASA. It was his dream when he was in high school to work for NASA, and he accomplished that dream. Um, and then some time later, he wrote a book about his experiences. The book's called Rocket Boys. Now, they made a movie out of his book, and they called it, they, I guess they figured Rocket Boys didn't really have the right connotation, right, wasn't gearing the right audience. They called it October Sky, but it was about Homer Hickam. Homer was a guy who knew success, who knew what it was to have a dream and how to achieve that dream. And as you can imagine, as he is speaking to a group of engineers, and there are some really, really smart people in this group. I didn't happen to be one of them. There's a lot of smarter people there than I am. But you can imagine you know, trying to come up with something to say that's, that's relevant and pertinent to an, you know, a group like that, and... and and his message that evening was on success, on his life experiences, what made him successful in his pursuits and what he's seen in other lives as well that has made people successful. And he shared with us that evening three key characteristics, three things that people needed to have in order to achieve something that they desired, in order to accomplish something that they dreamed of. And they started with a P. All of them started with a P. It was easy to remember. The first of these characteristics was passion. Homer said when he was growing up, he, in looking back on his experience in Colwood, West Virginia, he divided his life into two distinct eras. That which occurred before October 5th, 1957, and that which occurred after October 5th, 1957. And you may ask what happened on that day? That was the day that he heard that the Russians had launched the Sputnik satellite. And it changed his life. It, it, if you were around then, and that was 10 years before my time, if you were around then, that, that probably shook your world at some, that time too. Uh, to, to think that now we were lagging behind in a race with the Soviets. And, and he describes in his book about the, how the community was, was very concerned 
about what this might mean. And, and, and alarmed that we were behind technologically when we had historically been among the leaders in any kind of scientific advance. Homer, he loved his country. And he loved the idea of satellites and rockets. And he had a passion to be involved in that event. He wanted his country to be there, back on top. He wanted to help in any way that he could to, to advance the science of rocketry within the United States to help his side win. He had a passion for rocketry. The second element of this, 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 uh, these characteristics to achieve these kind of dreams that you have in life, he needed a plan. He announced one day that I, I'm going to build a rocket. <laughs> he, uh, he took some, some of the powder out of some bottle rockets, packed it into a flashlight, you know, old flashlight, stuck that in a, in a model airplane fuselage. It looked like a rocket. It had stuff in it that would, you know, a rocket might have. But when he lit it, it was more like a bomb. He blew up his mother's rose garden fence. He realized very quickly in his pursuit of his passion that he was going to have to have a plan. Because there's just some information that's required of rocketry that you simply just don't happen upon. You need to understand some laws of science, mathematics, that just don't materialize automatically in your brain. And he was going to have to spend some effort to get there. The books that he could find on rocketry assumed a working functional knowledge of calculus. He was struggling with algebra. He had to have a plan to get the information that he needed in order to be successful in what he was pursuing. The third P that he described for us that evening as you can imagine, was perseverance. I, I've already told you about one of his failures. And as you can imagine, because it's still happening, what happened last weekend? SpaceX, International Space Station shipment, blew up shortly after launch. Rocketry is one of those things that, even when you've mostly got a handle on it, doesn't always work like you think it will. It is inherently unstable that you are pushing a load from the bottom and trying to balance it as it ascends through thousands of feet of atmosphere. It's complicated. It's difficult. Even when you've mastered the principles. Even when you understand the plan. And there's failure. Failure that follows failure. And we still experience those kinds of failures today. And it's easy to give up. But he didn't. And not only was the work itself difficult for him, his father was, and this is West Virginia, and the town that he grew up in is called Colewood. So you can imagine what the, the general focus of life was in his community. His father was the superintendent of the coal wood mine. His father was ready for him to stop wasting his time blowing things up and start thinking about his future in the mine. You see, there was a completely opposite direction his father was focused than he was. He was focused on going to the sky. His father's on focusing on pushing him in the ground, quite literally. 
It was those who helped him, who assisted him, who encouraged him to keep going, keep persevering, that helped him be successful. So at this point, you're probably wondering, what in the world does this have to do with John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19? It wasn't long after I heard this message that I thought of this story because that's precisely the formula to success that Jesus gives to Peter. Let's read through again, think through again the passage we read a few moments ago. Peter, Simon, as Jesus calls him, Simon, son of John. You wonder why he calls him son of John. Simon Barjona. It sounds an awful like, a lot like he's addressing the, the Simon Barjona, the Peter who called him the Christ, the son of the living God, the one who confessed Christ. And I neglected to tell you, I neglected to set the context for you, John chapter 21 follows the cross. It follows the resurrection of Christ. It is a post-resurrection appearance. It is the epilogue of the gospel of John. And Jesus is dealing with a disciple, an apostle, who has failed. Who has denied him three times. Jesus calls to mind the Simon, son of John, Simon Barjona, of Peter, the rock, who confessed Jesus to be the Christ. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And you notice how many times he asked him the question. You can't help but, but think again to, that Jesus is somehow ev evoking the, the image of Jesus or of Peter. Denying three times, and Jesus is given the opportunity three times to acknowledge what? Simon, do you have a passion for me? If Peter was going to be successful as an apostle, as a disciple of Jesus, he was going to have to have, first of all, passion for Jesus Christ. Every time that he responds in the affirmative, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus gives him a direction, a directive, a plan. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. In being in the presence of the Son of God for three plus years, in seeing him all throughout his ministry, in seeing him experience deprivation and oppression and resistance and misguided, in some cases, followers and the power that Jesus manifested and the teachings that Jesus gave and the trial that Jesus endured and the cross which marked the end of his earthly ministry. And most importantly, what was taking place at that moment, a moment with the resurrected Christ, the one that God affirmed is his chosen one, whom he's raised from the dead. Peter witnessed all of those things. And Jesus has a plan for Peter. You need to tell people about that. You need to feed my sheep. Jesus ends the discussion with Peter by calling on him to persevere. When you were young, you went wherever you wanted to go. You were in control of the direction of your life. When you were old, you will not be in control. You will stretch out your hand. Someone else will put something on you, and they will take you where you don't want to go. 
Peter's failure came about because of intimidation. He was in a place where he felt threatened, where he felt alone, where he felt like everybody around him was just about to snap and put him right beside the one who, who was on trial. Just right, all those bold claims he made about dying with Jesus, he was afraid they were about to come true. Intimidation had defeated Peter in the past. Jesus said, be prepared for more of it. You're going to experience it again. And he doesn't even say the word, however, yet, but. He just says, follow me. You persevere. You stay with me. Passion, plan, perseverance. Those are qualities that aren't just successful, make successful rocketeers, engineers, rocket scientists. They don't make, they don't only make successful apostles. They make successful Christians. People who succeed in faith. In the New Testament, the Word of God bears that out. Let's look this, this evening, in this time that we have together, however much remains. Are they, they going to sound an alarm or bell? I just go whenever I feel like stopping them. Or when you get up and leave, one of the two. Passion. You and I are to have a passion for God. A passion for Christ. We are to have a deep and abiding love of God. If we belong to God, we must have a love for Him. Because it's commanded. Mark chapter 12. Verse 28. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus could have at that point said, you know, there are, you Bible scholars, check me on this, 618, is that what they have decided is the number of distinct commandments of the old law? There are 618 commandments in the law. They're all equally valid, equally weighty. Jesus could have said that, but he didn't. You know, you know how Jesus answered the question. There is a commandment that transcends all the rest, that matters more than any other commandment. Jesus answered, the most important is... Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your strength. It is an all-consuming passion. And it is commanded by God. We must be people who are passionate about God who are so engrossed in God that all of our life, all of our life's energy is spent adoring. And we understand what God means by love. We understand it better than Israel knew it in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because God has shown us what he means by love. He's demonstrated to us exactly what love looks like. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, the unique son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's on record as demonstrating how much he loves us. Not because of us, but because of him. And John, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, explains why it is we are to have this passion, why it is we can, are enabled to have this kind of passion for God. We love because he first loved us. We simply return what God has expressed to us. God calls us to love with all our hearts, all of our strength. And that only illustrates the kind of love with all his heart, with all his strength that he has for us. That passion is important. It drives us. It, 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 it changes the direction of our life. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verses 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, mammon. There are two different pulls in this life that Jesus identifies. The pull of the world and the lure of what you can find in this world, the richness of this world, the power that's in the world. Diametrically opposed to God. And you will love one or the other. You will serve one or the other. Having an all-consuming passion for God chooses that direction for us. We know which one we'll serve when we have a passion for God. Our passion compels obedience. Complete submission to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. And he who died for all, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. Who for their sake died and was raised. The love that we have, the passion that we have for Christ, it drives us to give ourselves completely to the will of God through Christ Jesus. And when we have that kind of passion, that kind of deep, bottomless love for God, worship becomes a natural expression, second nature. It becomes, it just... We just exude worship. You ever wonder why your worship is, is dull and flat? Maybe you should consider how much passion you have for God. I say that as one whose worship is sometimes dull and flat. Listen to the psalmist. Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart And flesh sing for joy to the living God. That's an expression. It doesn't say the word love. It doesn't say the word passion. It's an expression of love and passion for God. Our very created beings long to be in his presence. To offer praise to him. Worship to him. Worship isn't drudgery when we have that all-consuming passion. It becomes a refreshing exercise of that passion. We are to have a passion if we're to be successful in living for Christ. And having a faith that makes a difference. 
But it's not enough just to have all this love. In fact, I think it's impossible to have the kind of love that you can have for God unless you know, unless you've had expo- been exposed to what his plan is. You know, God is a planner. God sat down and planned. I don't know if he sat. He gets seated, right? Christ is seated. God, before he created the world, had a plan. He knew sin would enter into that creation. He knew his special creation would make mistakes, would fall away. And Ephesians says, before the foundation of the world, he chose. He made a choice. Save us through his Christ, through his anointed one, through his son. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9. Making known to us the mystery, that's a, that's a favorite word of Paul, mystery. Something that was hidden, something that was, was kept, information that wasn't revealed to previous generations and now has been revealed. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to him things in heaven and things on earth God had a master plan to reconcile a fallen world to unite to bring back into his holy presence an unholy and rebellious being created in his image me and you. God had a plan. And and God chose to reveal that plan. He unveiled the mystery through words. That's what the Bible is. It's God's revealed plan. It, it, It shows us what God has been up to all these eons, all these centuries from before time existed. It shows us what God's purpose really was, what his point really was, and how he accomplished it. Faith comes, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ, the message about the Messiah, the gospel. Acts chapter 11, verse 14, he will declare to you, this is the angel speaking to Cornelius, he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and your household. What saves us, what redeems us, what brings us back, reunites us with God is a message revealed by the apostles. James chapter 1, verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This plan that God has made known to us is the gospel. And and the plan impacts each of us individually. It's not sort of a broad thing that covers, it does, it's available to all. But we have an individual accountability and individual responsibility to do something with that message. As James says, we must receive the implanted word. We must obey the gospel. We must believe, we must take it as a point of fact that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the one who Peter saw and denied and affirmed as being risen from the dead, that he is the Son of God. We must, according to what this plan reveals to us, this word is revealed, God's plan revealed to us, says that we must repent, we must change the direction of our lives, we must be different than what we were before if we are to be saved. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, we must confess him before men. Otherwise, he will deny us 
before his father if we deny him before him. And we must, in, that, in an act of love, imitating the love that was shown to us on the cross in the death, in the burial, and the resurrection of God's Christ, we must imitate that very act by dying to ourselves in repentance and being buried with him in baptism, being raised to walk in newness of life. And Peter said as much in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when he's tending the flock, when he's feeding the sheep. That's the message of Peter. You who are convicted by the message, you are convicted by this word that you have killed the Christ and that God has raised him again, you must repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And according to, and, 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 and the, the underlying theme throughout the rest of the New Testament is that we must live a faithful life of service to him, having been reunited with him, having been reconciled to him, we must live faithfully, fruitfully. And, and God's plan doesn't really end for us at this plan of salvation, this plan of reconciliation, the plan of redemption, the good news, the gospel. God has a continuing plan for Christians, for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're going to be successful in your faith, if you're going to be fruitful, and God requires fruit, if you're going to be fruitful in your life, God has a plan for that too. We are to grow in knowledge. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, Peter says, for Peter. Chapter 1, verse 5. This is the same Peter that Jesus said, feed my sheep. What we are to grow on, what we are to grow in, is a knowledge of the revealed word of God. It's what develops us. It's what makes us able to live as productive, fruitful Christians in a hostile world. We must study the Word. Paul, in writing to his young, young friend, his young co-worker, Timothy, says uh, in verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, And from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, those words from God, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. The word prepares us to live a life of faith. Those of us who, have, who are in Christ, those who have, who have been redeemed, the word is equipping us, making us capable of doing whatever it is that God needs us to do. his plan and we are to share the knowledge of salvation for Peter chapter 3 verse 15 be ready to give an answer be ready to defend when someone asks the reason for the hope that is within you we must share knowledge of the plan it is a plan that it's not only accumulating knowledge you know but one thing if thinking back to to Homer and his and his rockets if if he had gotten all this, these equations in his mind and, and it had just stopped there and he'd never gone out and he'd never applied any of it, he'd have never grown. He'd have never developed, enhanced that knowledge with experience, done anything useful with it. It takes more than just knowing. It takes putting it into practice. And God's word is full of instruction, a call to live a life of action. We are to be a living body. Each of us working. Each of us productive in the kingdom. Ephesians chapter chapter four is a, one of the that in Romans chapter tw uh, chapter twelve verses six through eight. Two of the passages that are um, I, I constantly think of when I think of the work of the body. 
And you look at some of the language that's there in, in, in the Ephesians chapter 4 passage that God gave all these things, the, the apostles and the prophets and the, and the pastors and the teachers, the shepherds and the teachers, for the building up of the body so that we can each attain to the fullness of the image of Christ, so that we can grow, be strong, productive, Notice this phrase, when each part is working properly. Each of us is applying that thing. Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Use it. Take the knowledge that you've given, you've been given, and put it into practice. However, God has blessed you with a talent. However God has blessed you with a gift, go out and use it. Do something with it to his glory. If we fail to learn the plan, we will not be effective in living Christian lives. If we fail to continue to understand God's plan for living such a life, we will be diminished spiritually. Listen to the castigation. Listen to the chastisement that is, that is given to some readers of the Hebrew letter. Hebrews chapter 5, he's developing these, these complex uh, arguments as to why Christ is better than any system that God has given them in the past. And he'd like to appeal to something more and, and something more profound, but he can't because they can't understand it. And he says... For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you ought to be out there using the knowledge that you have to further the kingdom, to to enhance other people's spiritual lives. You need someone to teach you, again, the basic principle of the grace of God. You're requiring somebody else's input. You're not developing. We must have passion. We must have a pursuit a desire to learn the plan of God, and we must persevere. When Jesus tells the parable of the sower, he makes very clear in that passage, first of all, not everybody's going to receive this message. It gets sown. Not everybody's even going to to let it into their hearts. There's that path, the road, the, 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 where, the, where the birds come along and they take the seed away, it has no chance in their life because it's gone before they even consider it. Satan snatches it away. But notice two more destinations of seed that's uh, scattered by the sower. The rocky soil. Matthew chapter 13. What was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who, bear, who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. He's got passion. He understands the plan. Yet, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, he immediately falls away. No perseverance. No continuation. The thorny soil, it decides after a while it doesn't have so much passion for God. Cares for things in the world get in the way. The mammon becomes more valuable. And the seed becomes unproductive. We must persevere. We must hold to both the passion and the plan. In spite of the obstacles. Sometimes those obstacles take the form of opposition. People that are just opposed to the direction of your life. Just as Homer's dad was trying to direct him down to the ground while he's thinking up in the air. People are trying to direct you down to this life instead of up into where God is. Peter understood that kind of opposition. He had experienced it himself. In Acts chapter 5 we see that there, there those who've been preaching, they're called into the, in before the council and they're, they're accused of teaching in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. To which the apostles reply, we must obey God rather than men. 
I saw that on a church sign this week, by the way. I understood once I looked that up, Acts chapter 5, verse 29, I understood what they're talking about. It relates to current events quite well. We must obey God rather than men. There are people who are opposed to the direction that we're going in this life because we're choosing the way of Christ, and Christ said the world hated me, it's going to hate them. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Peter's calling for us to have perseverance. We persevere in light of the struggles, in light of the failures we're going to experience in life. If you live the Christian life, you're going to experience failure. The best that we have, the best that Christianity's ever produced, the people who are closest to Christ Jesus, Peter, who spent day after day with Jesus, still had moments of failure. Paul brings it up, Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, about how Peter, when he was intimidated, when he was afraid of what the men from Jerusalem would say, he withdrew from the Gentile Christians. And that's a failure. Peter failed. And Paul, who called him to account, Paul would say of himself, Romans chapter 7, verse 15, I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Verse 22, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. I fail, Paul said. Praise be God who offers us grace. Who, as Jesus points out so beautifully in the story, even before it takes place, Luke chapter 22, it's the scene of that last supper together. Simon? Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. And I have prayed that your faith will not fail. And notice what Jesus says now. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't even occurred yet. That's the most hurtful thing that Peter could do to him. Deny him at his, at his moment of greatest trial. Jesus has already seen past that. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I thank God we have a Savior who's able to see past my failures and see what I'm going to be and encourage me to be something more than that in the future. And Paul understood that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's perseverance. You know, I joked about the 50-minute thing. I think I've actually come close to hitting it. I appreciate very much your attention here tonight. We wouldn't have gotten to space. I'm convinced we wouldn't have gotten to space without people who had a passion for it, a plan to get there, and perseverance to keep trying. And I'm even further convinced. Peter would not have been the apostle that he was if he did not have a passion for Christ and adhere to God's plan for his Apostleship, his ministry, his role in the church, and persevere 
and get back up again when he failed and ignore the threats and the intimidation. And I would argue, and I present before you tonight, that we as Christians must have passion for our Lord Jesus and all-consuming, all-enveloping love for God. A desire to understand better the plan that He has for my life. And we may be at different phases in our spiritual development. It may be that there are those here tonight who have not regarded the plan of God for their lives. They had not developed a passion for God because they're not really fully realizing the great gift that's been paid for them, the great price that's been offered to them, and have not responded in faith to the plan of God, the gospel plan, salvation. Or there could be those here tonight who have not regarded the plan for their furtherance in understanding the knowledge of God in a practical way in their lives and they've just quit. Because their passion isn't what it was. Or maybe you just have a hard time persevering. The threats are too loud. There are too many around you who are who are going a different way, who are trying to push you into the ground instead of let you reach for the, scar, the stars, reach out to God. Or maybe you've just got tired of failing. We have a Savior who sees past failure. We serve a God who forgives. If tonight you have a need to respond to the gospel, have a need to reaffirm, as Peter did on that morning at breakfast, your passion for Christ Jesus. If there's a way we can be of assistance to you tonight, please let us know. We'll stand and sing and encourage you to come. Thank you, Glenn, for being here. Welcome back home. We didn't have to twist any arms to uh, agree to your invitation. Certainly, we appreciate it, and your work and your conviction to the gospel is adm admirable, and your family is a tribute to this community and to this congregation, and we want to congratulate you and ask you to please stay faithful and continue to spread God's word. Would you bow with me for a closing prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the evening that we've had, for this word that we've heard. Father, we know that you have the plan for our salvation. and We ask desperately that you give us the passion and the perseverance to see it to its conclusion. We know that there's challenging times of, in front of us and all around us, and the world seems to be so confused and so in turmoil. 
but we know the plan will see us through, and we know the plan will bring eternal life. We ask you to be with those tonight of our number, especially those who are traveling on behalf of this church and for the cause of Christ. We ask you to give them safety and give them a productive journey. Father, be with us, care for us always, and keep us as thy humble servants. For this is our prayer in Christ's name, and amen. You're dismissed.